this. I hope y'all are ready Amen. to take a little walk with me in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Um, I have some handwritten notes, which is, is not really my style, but that is just how God, because I couldn't get in front of the computer, I'm going to tell you, I couldn't get in front of the computer. The Lord was like, no, don't get in front of the computer, because see what happens, I'm going to tell you my style. If I get in front of the computer and I'm preparing a message, then I'm going to go to the Hebrew, I'm going to go to the Greek, because I have all those tools on my computer, and I'm going to begin to go deep and study it. Oh, but I wanted to bring something more, I just wanted to bring something different, and what I'm writing in my hand is more so coming from out of my spirit, because I don't have all the tools. So let's look at this story of Abigail and David. Now the title of this word, the message is, the power and purpose of perspective. The power and purpose of perspective. And we're going to look at perspective and we're going to um, get a perspective on perspective by looking at the story of Abigail and David. Now, just a little background. And I'm so glad we're leaders, so I don't have to go too deep. Here we have, by this time, we have David. We find David and his four mighty men of valor, who the scripture actually says, they describe these 400 men as the poor, <laughs> the distressed, the discontented, and the indebted. And it described them as men that came from honorable houses, or anything, but they were the poor, the discontented, the distressed, and, and the indebted. Okay? But yet they were loyal men. They were loyal to David. And we find these guys camping out in the strongholds in the wilderness of Paran. Now this is right after, when you look at chapter 24, this is right after David had an opportunity to take Saul's life, because of course his men are encouraging, take his life, take his life. But, you know, David had many reasons not to, mainly his, his even though he was a scoundrel, I'm just going to keep it real, he had a love for God. And I think how many of us can relate? We have some issues. Okay, we have some things with us, but we still have a love for God, right? And so he honored God. He honored God's man, and he was not going to take the man of God's life. So here, this is right after he had an opportunity to take his life in the cave, and he had not, okay? And, um, you know, because up before this time, he was on the run from King Saul, who had sought to kill David. Right. Up until this point, but now he had just spared his life in the cave. Saul, when he did that, and he revealed to Saul how he had an opportunity to kill him, showed him the cloth that he had cut from his um, gown. Saul then repented for even wanting David dead and confessed in 24, uh, verse 20. He said, This is King Saul. He says, I know indeed, him speaking to David, that you surely shall be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. So this is what the king says to David. So David, him and his men, they ride on off, and they take up their, their camp in the strongholds in the wilderness. Now, I want, us, I want to set us up for this perspective on the story before we read this account in chapter 25. There are actually two schools of thought when it comes down to a David period, but especially this account. There's two schools of thought. There's two perspectives. In a perspective, okay, uh, we have to understand that whatever our perspective is, that's how we're going to choose. If you have a negative perspective in life, then you're always going to make choices, okay, that are going to give you negative results. And if you have a positive perspective, they're going to give you positive results. 
So, so we have a perspective that the Bible writes that says Nabal is a fool, David is a hero. Okay? That's the biblical perspective. It, it lets us know, it, it, it puts Nabal out as being rude, stingy, idolatrous, presumptuous, unwise, short-sighted, drunk, contemptuous, dishonorable, dis, a, a disloyal citizen, proud, and selfish. That's how the Bible puts him out. And it puts David as heroic, brave, courageous, valiant, honorable, virtuous, kind, generous, Humble, living off the land, making his own way by living off the land, and even misunderstood that his motives are misunderstood by Saul, and, and Saul wants to kill him. Okay? That's one perspective. But then there's another perspective that we can look at where we can say, no, Nabal's not a fool and David's not a hero, but maybe David is a warlord. <laughs> and Nabal is actually the courageous one. Huh. I'm just, we're just introducing perspectives. Maybe David is lustful, covetous, a lustful, covetous warlord, leading an extortion ring. Now, now, now mind you, I just want y'all to just, I want y'all to open up your minds. Open up your minds, leaders. Open up your minds. Because a lot of times when we approach the scriptures, we already approach what we already know, what we, what we, what we see, uh, and we don't go into the spirit. We don't allow the Holy Spirit to lend us perspective. Right, right. We go in with what we read exactly on the surface without even understanding how to maybe pull back the text and look at metaphors, look at idioms, look at hyperbole, so on and so forth. And so, let's just take the perspective that maybe David is a warlord, Nabal's courageous. All right? Let's say David is lustful, covetous, warlord, leading an extortion ring, living not off the land, but the land owners. By levying protection, okay, you know how they come, okay? And so now they want to take your money, okay, because they protected you. Maybe take your goods, exercising raw power because he believes Nabal owes him. And then maybe Nabal is courageous. He has the courage not to bend to an extortioner. But maybe he is actually using wisdom over his household. Understanding as a landowner, a very, very rich man, what it takes to maintain all of what he has, he knows how many sheep he needs to keep grazing a land, a parcel of land, to keep that land producing. He knows all of what he needs to keep a perfect balance and run the operation that he has. So maybe he knows that what this man is asking for would, would throw off the balance of his whole business and he couldn't take that kind of hit and then recuperate. Maybe, maybe he was just using wisdom over his household. Maybe Nabal was loyal to the king that was on the throne. Maybe Nabal didn't want to be charged with treason and executed like the priests of Nob, how they were executed for giving, when David came and extorted, we'll just say, because we're using this perspective, things from them and the priests gave David what they asked, those priests were executed for treason, okay? So maybe he, was, he didn't want to be uh, 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 treasonous. And maybe uh, the, the part that talks in the scripture about him being drunk, okay, talking about Nabal being drunk, if you really understand that, it, it could also be the fact that at that time he was being generous to treat his people to a feast for doing well, honorable work during the shearing season. And whenever you have that shearing season, the sheep shearing season, it is a big event. And after they're done, they have a huge feast. They drink a lot. 
everybody is drunk. So to call him drunk here, it meant it implies that he was doing something that was out of order when it was actually all across everywhere. Everybody was just enjoying themselves. Big party. So I just wanted to introduce that perspective. So now, and also Abigail. Was Abigail, was she a dishonorable wife and an opportunistic woman when she ran up on David? Was she actually being dishonorable and disloyal to her husband? Okay? Or was she a wise wife and a generous woman when she was assisting David as he had asked? How do we determine? Uh. This is the question. How do we determine as leaders? That's what we just How do we determine as leaders the correct perspective? How do we determine this thing? As we see from the stories in the Bible, I do believe that sometimes we never know until the story is written and is read in hindsight. Uh. A lot of these people in the Bible, they don't know, we know their outcomes, but they didn't know when they were going through it. Right. They thought that they had been abandoned, forsaken, right, right, right. lost, whatever. That the promises didn't come to pass because they didn't live to see it. Right. But we see 2,000 years later, Abraham, we see the stars in the sand, he didn't see it. Uh -huh. So a lot of times, we don't know these things until after the story is written. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But my apostolic advice to you today is to lean into the Holy Spirit for perspective. Mm. And then trust him with the results of your decisions. Because if you don't, you will second guess yourself into a coma. You won't get anything done. Second guessing the perspective. Second guessing, should I, should I not? Is this person a fool or are they not? Da, 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 da. We had great conversations Saturday night on, or was it Friday night? You know, about that, Pastor, uh, Dr. Tyler, should I? And I said, honey, whatever you decide, I'm gonna ride, I'm gonna ride with you to the wheels fall off. You know what I'm saying? All we can do at the end of the day, we can, we can study a thing out and we can look at what we have standing before us, but we just have to just lean into the Holy Spirit and, and just trust what we sense on the inside, trust what we're hearing, and then go with that and just leave the results to God. Wait for the story to be written and look at that thing in hindsight. And we'll just believe God with the results. The power of perspective, though, because the message is about the power and purpose of perspective. The power of perspective, the power itself, the raw power, shifts. That's what it does. It shifts you. Perspective shifts you. And when you were reading, I had not read the, the forecast, mm -hmm. but it was talking about eternal revelation, which is divine perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, getting that, getting that sight right. Revelation. And so, we're, and so the season that we are going into, this is a season where divine perspective, eternal revelation is in abundance. This is the season for it. There's times when it's not, and there's times when it is. So the power of perspective, it shifts you. It can shift you into the truth. It can shift you into truth and God's plan or it can shift you out of it. All depending on your perspective that you choose. Okay? The per so the thing is knowing how to choose the right perspective. The purpose of perspective is the same. It has the power to shift you. But purpose itself adds a layer on top of that. A layer of authority. Because now, when you're in your purpose, you come, then you have an authority to, to act and to do when you're in your purpose, right? So the purpose of it, it adds a layer of authority. And, and it is for the, the sake of, or purpose of, the truth being seen clearly. The purpose of perspective is for the truth of a thing to be seen clearly. 
So God, you have an opportunity to get the right perspective so you can see the truth of a thing clearly. Truth is needed because that is what brings peace. That is what brings assurance. That is what brings endurance. That is what brings authority to see the thing that you are going after to see it to the end. Without peace and assurance, you won't have the endurance and authority to even make it to the end of the thing. So now let us read chapter 25, okay? God, thank you. All right, it's a small, but it's right, it's tight. <laughs> now, there was a man in my own whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing the sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. Uh-huh. But the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing the sheep. Now remember, we got two different perspectives. So I want y'all to do some mental calisthenics as we're reading the story. Not, let's not just hear what it is saying in the Bible, but let's and what if maybe. Because I'm going to tell you, when I studied David, I, the Jewish rabbinical accounts, I'm not going to say they have a different count account of David, but they have a fuller understanding. And they put all his dirty laundry out there. See, we don't because it's not all just laid out in the scripture. We see the acts, but we always just lean to the fact that he was a man after God's own heart. He was a man after God's own heart. So people are always, you know, rubbing him up and it's, you know, with David, you know, David was a good little boy. David was not. He was notorious. So, when David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David said, ten young men, and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. Praise God. And greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Uh -huh. Now, ain't that a, now listen, I watch all kinds of movies. <laughs> we, we, we watch all kinds of movies. And you got these gangsters that got these uh, areas of the city on lock. Okay, they're going to come up in your laundromat. They're going to come up wherever you are. And because they've been making sure nobody mess with you, they're going to come up with a nice sweet greetings and everything and be like, you know, peace, are all things well. Okay, everything's good. We good. We friends. Okay. I need you. I need you to, to, to help me out. And so here they are. He's like, tell them, you know, peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shearers, your shepherds here with us. <laughs> your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them. Hmm. Let me find my place. Nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Now, what in the first place? Why would he have hurt them in the first place? He wouldn't have any reason to hurt them because they were just hiding out from Saul. But I guess the fact or the virtue of people knowing how notorious these mighty men were, they were distressed. They were in debt themselves. They were discontented that they could have the propensity to, you know, to maybe do you harm. So, but he's like, no, we have, we didn't touch them. We could have, but we didn't. Okay, um, and your shepherds can attest to that. The end, nor was there anything missing from them all while they were in Carmel. Mm. Ask your young men, 
and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day, on a festival day, on a joyous day. So let the joy continue, okay? Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in the name of David and waited. Now Nabal means fool, right? That's the name, that's what his name means. Then Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away, each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men when I do not know where they are from? So David's young men turned on their heels and went back and they came and told him all these words. Then David said to his man, his men, every man girded on his sword. So every man girded on his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went with David and 200 stayed with the supplies. Now one of the young men told Nabal's wife saying, one of Nabal's servants told his wife saying, look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us and we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them. When we were in the fields, they were a wall to us, both by night and day, all the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore, know and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak to him. Mm -hmm. So you got two schools of thought on this. It's like, okay, David and his gang that came and ran up on us and demanded that we do some things. Now we can keep peace. We don't even have to fight. We don't have to be messed up with him. If we just give a little, little something, something for his people, right, right. then we can just continue to go on about our business. They won't mess with us. We won't mess with them. So, you know, you got to make a decision here, Abigail, what you going to do. Or it could be where David is in the wilderness, um, and maybe there are some other people that would have, besides David's men, that would have came and, and would have molested Nabal's uh, sheep shearers, and David and them, just because their presence was there, just kept off, kept the, the, the people from messing with them. And David, knowing this, was like, okay, well, you know, we did you a solid, we need a little something, something here, okay? But the bottom line that I find very intriguing is that David did kind of have that attitude, like we were talking about the other day, and I was talking to Danny, um, because we are talking about how people are always mugging and taking advantage of older people, or people in a vulnerable state, and how people can actually have the mentality of, that they'll come after you to rob you and to mug you, and they will say something to you like, give me my money. What you mean, give you, give, give you your money? This this my money. But you know, but people will wake up in the morning and be like, I'm gonna go get my money. They ain't even work today, but you their money is in your pocket. And they are actually convinced that you owe them something. That's right. For whatever reason, you need to pay me not to kill you. You need to pay me not to hit you. That's my money. So give it to me. And so, you know, which one is it? So then Abigail, verse 18, made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five seers of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, go on before me. See, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. So was she being a dishonorable wife, or was she using wisdom? Hmm. It depends on your perspective. So it was as she rode 
on the donkey that she went down under cover of the hill and there were David and his men coming down toward her and she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him. And he has repaid me evil for good. So he said here, I have kept him from getting beat up and I have not allowed my men to mess with him. And this is how he's going to repay me. So I'm just like, what's this mentality? We've got to pay you for doing what's right in the first place? Hmm. So, may God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. Now David wasn't going to go kill everybody, but he was just going to go kill every male in Nabal's household and in his employment. He was going to wipe out the sea because as long as he take out the sea, he take out the strength and authority, the rest is going to fall. So now when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. And please, let your maidservant speak in your ears. And hear the words of your main servant. Now before we say what she said, I want y'all to understand how the Jews, the, the Hebrews see Abigail and how she is written. She is considered, she is known as one of the seven female prophets of Israel. She is the only wife of David because she ends up becoming his wife that is spoken of as um, good and uh, honorable, okay? And so she has these qualities. She's spoken of in a very positive light. And so we are talking about the power of, the power and purpose of perspective. We're talking about getting heaven's perspective on the matter. And that's what a prophet does. They help to give you heaven's perspective, right? So here she comes and she says, please, let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Huh. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. So one, either she's being dishonorable to her husband, calling him a fool, or she is describing or giving them, uh, 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 David an understanding that he doesn't understand the nature and the strength of what he's doing and in, in, in the position that he's really putting his family in. Please for, forgive him. So she goes on, she says, but I, your maidservant did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. They didn't come talk to me. They talked to him. Mm. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there she goes into the prophetic. Since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly Make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet, a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life. But the 
life of my Lord shall be bound in the buckle of the living with the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. Now she's prophesying, in, she's prophesying because there's other scriptures that talks about how the Lord is going to bundle when he separates the wheat from the tear, how he's going to bundle together the wheat, those who are marked for salvation and for ruling and reigning with him. And so she's prophesying to him and saying, my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies. He shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you, nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, my husband, then remember your maidservant. So she is giving him the blueprint. She is giving him in the spirit, in the prophetic. Uh -huh. She is giving him the blueprint for his kingdom, for the establishment of his kingdom in the perspective that he's going to have to shift into if he's going to see what God has for him. She's doing that. And she's also putting in a little something, something on the extra for stuff. And you know, and when you get there, uh, don't forget about it, sister. You know, don't, don't, don't bring back any repercussions on our household. Whatever it is, just find favor with me. So then David said to Abigail, blessed. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice. And blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. I would ask you as leaders, is your advice blessed? Do, do, does, it, does it have the, the weight of glory? Does it have uh, salvation and healing and deliverance in it when you speak to people? Does your advice shift perspectives and save lives? This man of God says she was blessed. He, he blessed her. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light no males would have been left to make all. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. My God. When I think about even the song, Heaven's Perspective, and how it was saying that you made a way in desert places for me. Here David and his men were in the wilderness. They were in desert places. And God sent his word and made a way in a desert place for this man of God to actually continue unheeded his path to the throne. Now Abigail went to Nabal and there he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. Therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became like a stone. He went into a coma for ten days. And after that happened, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. And so the, the other school of thought, the other perspective is that, she dishonored Nabal in such a way, and Nabal just couldn't believe that his wife had taken up with the warlord, had ran off, made a secret deal, okay, and, and now he, it, it, it just broke his heart, right? That's the other perspective. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Bless be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. 
And David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife. And when the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. Then she arose, bowed her face to the earth, and said, Here is your maid servant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And she rose in haste and rode on a donkey, attended by her five maidens. And she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. So, there's two different perspectives. And as, as leaders, when we are ministering to people, we've got to be very slow to speak, we really got to. We got to. We've got to hear from God. We 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 got to know that we are giving godly counsel from the throne of God. See, godly counsel doesn't have anything to do with whether a person is saved or not saved. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because you can get godly counsel from a heathen on the street, man, and you can get ungodly counsel from an apostle. What makes the counsel godly or ungodly is whether or not it is coming from God, not the vessel. So there's plenty of people hmm. that are unsaved that God can speak his truth to That's right. through, through them to you. Amen. And there's plenty of us who can be speaking of prophesying from our soul. But Abigail prophesied to David and shifted his perspective into the truth of God's plan and will for him and not out of it. Mm. She prophesied and shifted him into it. Being, like I said, one of the prophets of Israel, she prophesied to him his military victory over his enemies and his future as king over Israel. She gave him a perspective. She began to give him a blueprint of how God would have his kingdom to be established. Her intelligence and wisdom saved David from sin mm. and preserved his throne, his kingdom, and his house, his name. She saved her husband's life, herself, Amen. her legacy, all her husband built, the people in the land, this one woman. Blessed advice is the best advice. Mm. And it is the mark of a spirit-filled, spirit-led prophet. Or man or woman of God. The spirit leads us and guides us into all truth. But, but I just really applaud Abigail because whether she was a good wife or a bad wife, no matter what her intentions was, she is a woman to be admired among women because she would have been able to prophesy a divine perspective and eternal revelation to David if she herself first, at least first didn't have one, okay, of herself, of David, and mainly her situation. How many women, come on, she was, she was amazingly courageous, wise, anointed, intelligent, humble, and skillful. She was all of these things in the midst of uh, looking like she was getting ready to go to the gas chamber. You know what I'm saying? But most of us, my God, if we were facing an issue like that, Will we be able to pull off such a feat and shift the coming tide of a massacre on our home without shedding a tear and having an emotional meltdown? Mm -hmm. But actually being able to get up and go out and speak to the income oncoming storm and, and not have an emotional meltdown. Mm -hmm. this, is what, this is what God is calling us to. So let's examine ourselves as leaders, as men and women of God. This is what God is calling us, how he's calling us to respond. Okay? You are just a perspective shift away.
from your victory. Jesus, hallelujah. You are just a perspective hallelujah. shift away Thank you, Jesus. from your healing. Yes. Thank you. you are just a perspective shift away from your wealthy place. Mm. Thank you. My God. Thank you, Jesus. You are a perspective shift away from your joy. Yes, the fullness God. Mm. of joy Thank you, Jesus. from your peace you are just mm. a perspective shift away yes from your rest mm. marguerite Jesus. shift your perspective a perspective shift away from your blessing holy spirit has heaven's perspective about you yes. and about the people that God would have you to minister to. He has heaven's perspective about all things that you are concerned about and all things concerning this earth. God can send his word and sends his word in the mouth of his prophet to shift your perspective and put you right where you need to be. Amen. David's life was, his life was very scandalous, controversial, but God had purpose for him, irrespective of how people viewed him, or even how he behaved. God's revelation, eternal perspective of David wasn't based on anyone's viewpoint, it was based on God's viewpoint of who David was. So, God made sure that David got that perspective. Whether you think a person, as leaders, we have to understand, whether we think the person that we're talking to is a fool, <laughs> or whether they are wise, if God has purpose for them to be a part of his plan, no man can remove them out of God's viewpoint of this person, God's perspective of them, God's perspective will prevail, and God will send word after word after word in the mouth of a prophet to shift their perspective yes, and to put yes, them sir. where they need to yes, be. Sir. Amen. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. You just yes, trust the oh, Lord. God. That's the word of God. That's the word that God gave us a couple of years ago now, and the season is coming to pass in 2020. He already said, 2020 vision is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. Ah. If you believe the Lord your God, ye shall be established. David believed the Lord his God when he heard the voice of God through the prophet of God. And it established him. It shifted his perspective so that his kingdom could be established and that there would be no end to his kingdom. If you believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. You will be pushed forward. Not only will you be established, but you will advance. You will prosper. You will be pushed forward forward into that you will have momentum. Mm. Jesus. You just trust the Lord. Be established. Trust his prophets and prosper. The kingdom of God, we have to understand that the kingdom of God is voice activated. Mm. Is voice activated. So prophets, when they come bringing the kingdom of God, they come to enlighten you. To take that they come to invade the darkness of your mind. They come to, to dispel the negative perspective. Y'all know how negatives are in the dark room, right? I guess they don't do that stuff no more. I don't know. Maybe they do. It's dark in there in the dark room. That's right. They come to bring enlightenment to those dark areas. They come to correct the faulty understanding and beliefs that, God, that, that, that 
you may have about your perspective and, and how God is and what God has for you and what you are called to do. They come to bring correction to that. And they come to give you instruction. The kingdom of God is voice activated. The prophets bring the kingdom in their voice. Prophets, they are called to, to build. They possess a building anointing uh, uh, and, 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 and they build paradigms. This is, where, this is where they operate from, okay? And this is what they produce. And they bring forth building words. They assist in the formation and the implementation of God's building plans. That's why the Word of God talks about um, the, the, the kingdom of God, the church being established on the apostles and the prophets. So the apostles and the prophets, they work together to, to foundate and to build. And so the prophets, they assist in the formation and the implementation of God's building plans. They are the ones who God gives insight to. So they have insight. They know what God desires to do in the earth in a set hour. So this woman of God, this, this wife, this prophet, she had insight. She had eternal revelation. And she released it into David's hearing. And I can just imagine them, because y'all come on now. They both were descending. They both were coming down two sides of the hill. And David's men, they were, they, I mean, they were ready. But she spoke to him, and I can just imagine how it just began to just shift them, shift them, shift them to the point. And he was like, okay, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. She gave him another perspective on how he was going to get to his throne. Prophets, they shift climates and cultures, perspectives, and they release revelation and impartation for divine building. And that's what she did. She shifted the climate. She shifted the culture. She released the revelation and an impartation for divine building, the, the establishment and the building of his kingdom. The kingdom is voice activated, y'all. They operate and release fresh wind and fresh word. Yes. And they create a building momentum in the earth. So when this woman of God spoke to the man, it shifted him. And it created a building momentum in David to, to pursue the path to, 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 to shift off of his present course so that his kingdom that God was going to build through him would be built ah, with no hindrance. And as the woman of God ministered to us through the forecast, this is the month, this is the season that we as leaders, that we have oh, help from heaven. <laughs> Where the, the season is perfect for us to be able to wage successful warfare with our words. That's what I wrote down. That's what it said. This is the month that you must war with words. And that this is the month that God draws out a new anointing from you. A new anointing. This is the month. This is the month. Hallelujah. So I just want to bring this word to you about perspective. So that as leaders, we really begin to, to lean into God and make sure that even in our ministry, we know that I, I, I'm confident that when we approach ministry, that we are approaching and, and praying in our prayer language and pressing into God so that we can minister from God's heart. But I want to ask you today to add on a layer in your request, in your request, in your petition, as you're preparing to minister, that God make sure that even the perspective, because see, a perspective is, is just the view. It's the view. Uh, it's the view.
you. So we can all be looking at the same mountain, but we're not all standing exactly in the same place. And if you're just over just a little bit, you're going to see more snow on the mountain. You're going to see more trees. And so it's the same mountain, but a different perspective. We want to make sure that we are looking at it from that eternal perspective that God is speaking and we are really speaking in a way that's going to shift them into the path that's going to bring them to their predestined end. To be a prophet of God, I, you know, I, I don't envy prophets. We are all called to prophesy, but the walk in the office of a prophet. Mm. <sighs> to me, I think that's got to probably be the heaviest mantle. The, the most judged mantle. The one that God probably, I'm not going to say that any of the others aren't important, but the prophet can wreck lives like, like nobody's business could wreck lives. Evangelists, not so much. Evangelists can, can get in the way maybe of somebody's growth by maybe not evangelizing correctly and not bringing the gospel theology correctly. So maybe a person's born again experience may not be totally complete. They could have something missing. But a good teacher can come along and tweak that and shift that. You know, when you look at all the but a I have heard and seen one, one, I will, one instance I will share with you. Years ago, a prophet, I wasn't there when they prophesied it, but a good friend of ours came back and several other people were there. He came back and, and testified that a mighty woman of God, mighty woman of God, prophesied spoken to a young man's life who was about 17 years old and released the word saying that she saw a spirit of suicide on him. But they didn't do work there to well whatever work that they did whatever that prayer they prayed or whatever they did not deliver him from that. And they did not follow through. They did not. They, they released the spirit onto him, but did not take it off of him. And the boy killed himself. I'm not saying that he wouldn't have if they didn't, but I'm just saying I don't envy the office of prophet. Because you have the power of life and death. In your tongue. We all know that we have power, life, and death in our own lives. We have the ability to decree and declare a thing and it shall be so. We have the ability to rewrite the laws that govern our life. I thank you, God, for that. But, but a, a, a prophet's have an authority that's beyond the power that we walk in if we are not in the office. We have power, but maybe not all of the authority. So I just want to just pray. Um, and if you have, the, the altar is open, and, and if you have a desire for prayer of any kind, I will stand in the gap with you, and I will pray on your behalf. I don't know what your need is. Don't know. It's just an open call, because I know we have leaders, so I'm not, you know, I have to call you to salvation. But if you have a need at all, I want to pray with you. I want to believe God with you. I want to stand in the gap for you. I want to touch and agree with you. If you have any need at all. But I'm believing that we are coming into a time in God 